uh, density in the, in the phase space of dimension uh, 2nd, okay? And so what you prove actually is that if you look at this, uh, this marginal, so the marginal of order k, what you will prove is that actually it will converge to f to the k. Okay, so if you look at k particles, say k, k typical particles in your, uh, in your system, and you look at the joint distribution of this k particle, then essentially it will converge to this product here, which means that actually the particles, say if you take k of them, uh, so typically they, they stay independent. Okay, so that, that, that's what is called the propagation of chaos. Okay, and so um, now this is, uh, this is uh, essentially uh, the, the, the law of large numbers for this system in low density regime. Okay, so I, I, I didn't uh, write it uh, today, but uh, it's, it's exactly like uh, yesterday. So of course this, this is only in the low density regime. But now you see that uh, uh, we end up with a question, which is that here in this F, uh, since uh, it's the solution of the Boltzmann equation, we know that some information is missing, okay? Because if you look at the entropy of the system here, so in the limit, in the limit here, you see that the, the, the entropy uh, will be uh, decreasing, so or increasing, uh, so, so the, the quantity of information is decreasing, okay? And so this means that when taking this limit, you have, say, forgotten something, okay? And so, um, I would like to explain why, why it's important uh, to, to retrieve this information to answer many different questions. So the first question is, uh, is just to under understand uh, where the entropy is, okay? So first question. Um, say, we would like to, con con to understand something on the cascade of entropy. where is the missing information. So essentially, we know a little bit of this. I, I will come back uh, soon. Uh, uh, maybe I can just uh, recall you that uh, the proof is something like this. So you, you look at your uh, dynamics. You represent your dynamics as a superposition of collision tree like this. Okay, something like this. And you say that you will uh, remove all the trees such that you have a connection like this. So you have a loop. Okay, so essentially, you know that the information which is missing is all this information which is encoded in these bad trees for which you have a loop. Okay, so the information that is missing is encoded in bad trees so for which you have a loop. At least one loop. Okay, but of course, this is not really precise. We would like to really understand uh, much more the structure of these correlations. So this is, this is something that uh, will be really important. And then, of course, it's important to, uh, say, understand the structure of correlation if you would like to say more than just the law of large number. Okay, so if you would like to say something about the small fluctuation around this, this law of large number, so small fluctuation around the Boltzmann equation, so what you say that's with say with almost probability one, you will uh, have a dynamics which is well, well described by the solution of the Boltzmann equation. But of course, this is, a, this is, this is a, an average. And so you have some fluctuation around this. And if you would like to characterize this fluctuation, of course, you need to understand a little bit more than just this first approximation, okay? So if you would like to uh, describe a fluctuation around the average dynamics, of course, uh, this, this is uh, typically what you have when you have a central limit theorem. You expect this fluctuation to be uh, of a, a much smaller order, but uh, so you like to somehow uh, really um, uh, focus on these uh, small scales, okay? So, so this, these are small corrections. And another thing that uh, you could be interested in is to say, okay, now sometimes it may happen that I observe something else than this uh, Boltzmann dynamics, okay? It's, of course, uh, even though it will uh, uh, happen uh, with probability of Boltzmann, 
it's just almost one. So something else uh, could happen. So for instance, if you just, uh, just look at the reverse dynamics, so you look at a uh, dynamic, of course, if you just look at the reverse dynamics, it's uh, one possible dynamics, and you see that you will so see something which, is, which has very uh, low probability, but still it can exist. Okay, and so what you uh, would like to do is just to characterize and uh, to, to uh, uh, measure the probability of rare events. So that's what is called a large deviation in probability. Okay, so this, this, this is what you would like to do just to go beyond this very first approximation, okay? So you say, okay, in average I have this, <coughs> but maybe I'm not, uh, it's not enough to say what happens in average. You like to say more, and this is the typical question that you uh, uh, could ask, okay? So now if you uh, would like to answer to this question, you have to, say, characterize much more precisely the, this kind of bad events, okay? They, they don't happen very often, but still they can happen. And we would like to co understand the structure of this 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 kind of uh, uh, this kind of trees. Okay, so uh, now what I uh, would like to do to start with is to introduce some some very uh, general tools from um, say combinatorics or statistical physics to uh, to study this kind of correlations. Okay, so. Um, And then I, I will show you how to, to use them in this uh, context of uh, art sphere dynamics. Okay, so I will start with uh, an example, which is, uh, say, the simplest possible example without dynamics, without anything like this. And uh, so, actually, this example is uh, related to, for instance, the, the initial data. So assume that you have still this uh, system of uh, art spheres or any... Uh, say, relation that you have that, uh, um, <coughs> and you say that uh, you are interested in this function here, so gn, which is the product for i different from j, that uh, of the indicator function that, say, i is, uh, I will denote this like this, is not close to j. Okay, so this can be, uh, for instance, can be that uh, the distance between uh, xi minus xj is bigger than epsilon. But this epsilon is small. Okay, so I have this function here. Of course, this is for all i and all j between 1 and n. Okay, so this is a symmetric function. And of course, if epsilon is very small, of course, if it's zero, it's very easy because it's just one, okay? But of course, if epsilon is, is very small, then what you expect is that it will be almost one, okay? So in first approximation, this guy will be one. See, if you fix n and you let epsilon goes to zero, then this guy is almost one, okay? So gn will be one plus something, say, of the order of epsilon. Okay, so here you see that this guy here, this is uh, the, uh, say by analogy, it would be just uh, the average of this, say, what happens when epsilon is small, this is just one. Okay, so this, this is, say, the, the, the principal order. And then you like to understand a little bit uh, more the structure of, so <laughs> of course, uh, this will not, not be one uh, all the time. Okay, and so if n equal two, you see that it's uh, really easy because uh, then you can just expand this and say that, okay, now g2 is just one minus, so the fact that i is close to, say one is close to two. Okay, and so uh, this will be uh, small, say in uh, L1 norm if, if, if you have this relation here. Okay, so this is what we will call the second order cumulant. So it tells you that say that the first correction is due to some, uh, to some 
yeah, some correlation between particle one and particle two, if they are close to each other, then of course you have this small correction. Okay. For the moment, this is is just completely uh, an abstract setting. Okay, and then uh, I will let you know what is n epsilon and all, all these kind of things. Okay. Okay. So this 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 is uh, now you can. Uh, a little bit more complicated, look at uh, G3, okay? So now you see that you have uh, 1 minus, uh, say, 1, 2, 1 minus uh, 1, 3, and 1 minus 2, 3. Okay, so it's the, the first term is still 1, okay? And then you have terms which are wh where you have just one of them here, so plus 1, 3, plus 2, 3. And you see that this corresponds exactly to uh, this second order cumulant here. Okay, you have just two guys which are connected by this, this relation. Okay, and this is of order of epsilon. Okay. But then you have uh, uh, other terms. Of course, you can have two of them. And you see that as soon as you have two of them, actually, it's, uh, you have uh, the three of them. Okay, one... Uh, Two, one, three, and plus, uh, okay, so should be uh, two, three, and one, three, and a minus one, two, three. Okay, so all these guys, so actually, you see that uh, uh, in all this, this term here, you see that you have a connection with between one, two, and three. Okay, so this term will be of the order of epsilon square. Okay, because you have two constraints that uh, the, the, the particles have to be uh, close to each other. Okay, and all this thing here will be uh, called the third order cumulant. But you see that actually this third order cumulant, you have different terms, okay? Because you have this term which, uh, which you have products of only two quantities here, and you also have this, this guy where you have the product of the three. Okay, but of course everything is, so you see that they are uh, somehow uh, uh, the, sa the same order. You, you don't care about having two or three links. It will be the same because, say, everybody is in the same cluster. Okay, so this notion of cluster is, will be important. Here you see that you, are, you have a cluster of size three. Okay, you can have different uh, graphs, but say the, the size of the cluster is still three. Okay. Okay. So now uh, there is, of course, uh, we will not uh, do it for four because it becomes a little bit complicated. But we have uh, systematic uh, general formulas to do that. Okay. So um, we will call cluster um, cumulant of order n. So I like will call uh, a small g uh, g n will be um, the sum from s equal 1 to n of the sum on all partition with s parts uh, in this set of, uh, of n <coughs> guys. And then you have minus 1 to the s minus 1, factorial s minus 1. And then you have the product from i equal 1 to s of g of sigma i. Okay, so this is, this is a, this g, of course, the length here is sigma i, and you just have this. Okay, so this is, say, the general definition. Okay, so if you can just uh, check that uh, g2 will be exactly uh, this guy here, and g3 will be exactly this guy here, but of course you can define all of them. Okay? So what is important with this, uh, this definition of cumulants? So there are many properties which are important. So the first one is that once you have all these cumulants, you, you, you know all the information. Nothing is lost. Okay, of course, if you have just uh, the first two cumulants, you know a little bit more than, uh, than just with just the first one. But uh, you see that there are some correlations that are missing. Okay? Now, if you have all these cumulants, then you can recover uh, the whole information because you have this inversion formula that uh, capital GN 
will be the sum from s equal 1 to uh, n, the sum of all partition of uh, the product from i equal 1 to s of small g of uh, sigma i. Okay, so this means that once you know this family, you, you have all the information, nothing is lost. Okay, so all the information is encoded in the family of QVNs. <coughs> So th this is the first uh, very good property of uh, this cumulus is that, uh, okay, this is kind of transform, but uh, say in the end, everything is, is, is uh, kept, okay? So this is the first important property. And then there is another property which tells you that uh, uh, somehow this decomposition does exactly what you would like uh, it to do, which is to uh, uh, say quantities which will be uh, of different sizes, okay? So each time you look at a cumulant uh, with higher order here, you expect the contribution to be of smaller order, okay? So typically what you can prove is this uh, relation with clusters. So what you have, so relation with clusters. So in the case when uh, this capital G of course, you can define this for any family uh, of symmetric function, Gn. Okay, but in the case when this Gn, say, comes from uh, this kind of uh, definition here, then you can prove that uh, essentially this uh, uh, small Gn is localized on clusters of size n. Okay, so Gn, with so for such a, a capital Gn, is localized on clusters of size n. Okay, so you see that typically if you uh, uh, look at this, uh, this decomposition here, you see that each gn, because you have this all these clustering constraints, so you have a chain, okay? So a cluster, what is a cluster? Cluster means that uh, essentially uh, your, uh, your uh, graph is connected. Okay, so you have a connected graph, okay? So the cluster is a cluster connected graph which means that uh, you can have a chain. <coughs> okay, so if you have this chain, this means that uh, if you would like to compute the order of this guy, you see that you have uh, n minus uh, one independent uh, condition, cl clustering condition, and so you expect this guy to be of the order of epsilon to the n minus one. Okay, so this tells you that uh, Gn should be of the, say, the the support of Gn will be of the order of epsilon to the n minus one. Okay, because from any connected graph, you can you can extract somehow a minimally connected graph, and then you get exa exactly n minus one independent constraints. Okay, so th this is very good because actually you say that now you have this kind of ordering. So you can write this Gn or any Gs as a sum of, of so just with this, uh, this uh, decomposition here, you see that you have a sum of uh, a first part, which is of the order of one, and then something which is of the order of epsilon, and then epsilon square, and, and so on. Okay, so you have all this, this ordering of correlations. Okay, so this, this gives you an ordering of correlations. And so actually this, this, uh, this uh, cubulants have been uh, uh, studied for a while and there, there is something which is uh, really important, uh, which is uh, the fact that, see that if you start writing things like this, this is actually very bad because if you just, if you just count the number of terms, this is very uh, large compared to the, the actual size of the guy, okay? Because you have this cancellation between one and minus one. Okay, so uh, there is a, a last property that uh, actually I, I would not really use uh, that we, we need, but uh, I would not really use uh, today, which is uh, this uh, tree inequality, which is due to Penrose. Which tells you that uh, you, you can count the number, say, the size, 
the L infinity size of this guy here, so still uh, starting from this, uh, this, uh, this same d definition of uh, capital GN. And you see that actually if, if you count, say, in a silly way, you will have essentially uh, uh, an estimate here with a, a factorial n, okay? But you can try to count thi this a little bit, uh, uh, a little bit, uh, and then uh, what you can do is to uh, just relate it, uh, this this sum over connected graph on a sum over minimally connected graph, okay? So you can so essentially wh what you do is that uh, you for any connected graph you in in introduce a kind of projection on, on minimally connected graph. So you have to, to define this uh, this embedding. Okay, of course, it's, it's, it's clear how we can. Uh <coughs> and then uh, you can prove that uh, you have uh, you can uh, use this constellation between plus and minus, and say so, say in the end what you can prove is that essentially it will be uh, uh, not bigger than factorial n. Okay, so essentially what you can prove is that uh, okay, maybe I will not. Uh, so so this I would just say that uh, uh, we can. Uh, take advantage of the cancellation. Okay, so this will not be really important for all this lecture because essentially I will try tomorrow to answer this question here, but it's important only to answer this question about large deviation because at some point you need to uh, resum everything. And so with one factorial, N, it's okay, but if you lose uh, many of them, then it's, it's really complicated to, uh, to be able to sum, up, to sum up all of them. Okay, so it will not be really important in this lecture, but it's uh, something which uh, actually exists and it's, it's good to know too. Okay, so this is the very, um, say, the very um, um, abstract setting that I would like to use, but of course, now I'm not interested in this, uh, in this uh, exclusion for, uh, for this, uh, say, for this uh, sphere or for this <coughs> whatever you want. What I'm interested in, in the dynamics of art spheres. Okay, so what I would like to do, essentially, is to uh, find a good setting to apply this kind of uh, classification of, of the correlations, but for the di dynamical thing. Okay, so that, that's what I will try to do. And so, uh, we call this uh, dynamical cumulants. Okay, so uh, typically what I would like to, um, so actually there are many uh, different types of dynamical cumulants. I will start with the simplest possible one, which are just uh, uh, dynamical cumulants for uh, between the, say, uh, which are uh, space correlations. Okay, so if I'm interested just in space correlation for the, for the moment. So what I would like to uh, compute is something like uh, the expectation. Okay, so for this uh, measure that uh, of, say, I will try to have something like this. So I will have this guy, say I test this on the first function h1. So this is uh, now it's uh, uh, zi of t. So zi is uh, both the, 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 the position and the velocity of my particle number i. And I multiply this, okay, so somehow here I have a sampling of the empirical measure uh, against this test function h1. And now I, I have another one, say, H2, of course, I can do with uh, many of them. Okay, I can do with, uh, okay, I can have P of them. HP of the I of T. Okay, if I would like to say something on the correlations and uh, on the, then I, I need to understand a moments like this. Okay, that's, I would like to say it's kind of sampling of the empirical measure. So that, for the moment, it's at uh, for one time, but of course we can imagine to have the same kind of correlations for different times. Okay, so instead of having one time for all these functions here, I could imagine that I will have T1, T2, and T, T and, uh, P. Okay, 
So, but let's start with this uh, space correlation. So, for the moment, time is the same for every, everybody. Okay. So now, what you can do is just to uh, expand this, and so you see that you will have uh, different uh, different kind of uh, of function here. But uh, so there will be one term which is uh, maybe uh, the the most important term. So actually, uh, in the end, we will need all of them. But we will have something like uh, h1 of z1 of t, h2 of z2 of t, hp of zp of t, where one say here one two and p are different. Okay, and so the, the terms like this. If the typical number of particles is n, then in the grand canonical setting, what I hope, what I can expect is that I will have, say, this will be uh, mu to the p, which corresponds to uh, choosing one of one particle here uh, among uh, mu. Okay, and I integrate this. Okay, so I would like to know the expectation of this. Okay, and so. Now, what I say is that uh, this is exactly what I can compute with by integrating this fp uh, that I wrote yesterday, z1 zp times h1 of z1 hp of zp. Okay, so up to this factor mu to the p. Of course, there are many other terms because uh, when you develop the sum here, we can have two terms or three terms which are equal. Okay, but the term where all terms are different is like this. Okay, so now you see that, say, the, the thing that I would like to develop in cumulant is this guy. Okay, because so what we know is that, say, in first approximation, we, we know that this guy will behave exactly like f to the power p here. Just because we know that, say, with high probability, almost one, we know that we have propagation of chaos. So we know that this fp will be something like f1 to the p. Okay? But of course, now it's not all the information. If I do that, it's exactly like here if I just keep the one. Okay? Because there are some small correction around this. Okay, so if I would like to, to understand the correction, of course I have to remain the, the most important part. If else I will not see uh, the, the, the small thing in of the order of epsilon or epsilon square or epsilon to any power, if I keep the main order, which is one. Okay, so what I would like to do is really to, uh, to find uh, the uh, cluster expansion of this guy. Okay, so that's exactly what I... Uh, what uh, my goal is now is to start from this guy, okay, and then try to uh, find the cluster expansion of this guy. So now, of course, this guy, I can uh, do exactly the same as here. So here, this was just the F1. So I start from one particle and I just write the dynamics. But I can do the same if I start from P particles. Okay, so now I start from P particles. I have my P particles. So say by pi particle one here, I will. Uh, denote by star all the particles which are from the beginning, okay? And now I can write, okay, I can write that uh, fp exactly for the same reason as yesterday. So when I wrote, when I wrote all this equation about, say, transport and collision, I can write that uh, each of these particles will uh, be uh, evolved by uh, transport and it will collide, okay? So I have a tree like this. And then like this, and then like this, okay, and the same for this one, okay, and the same for this one. Okay, and so um, the fact that fp will converge to f to the p tells you that essentially these trees, okay, at leading order, they just exist independently from each other. Okay, so if you have exactly a product, this tells you that essentially you can put one tree here, one tree here, one tree here, and then you can move them uh, independently from each other. Okay, so that's, that's exactly what what's would be the case if you have exactly a product. Okay, so, 
And now, uh, of course, uh, each of these three will have exactly the same structure. So what we have seen here today is that what can, can cancel at leading order is uh, what we call here an internal recollision. So inside a tree like this, we know that the probability of having uh, this, this uh, bad recollision is small. Okay, so this I will call internal recollision. Okay, but now, of course, if you, have, uh, if you start from these uh, p particles, then at some point it may happen that you have also a, an external recollision, meaning a recollision between two trees. Okay, just because you have your particles, they have size epsilon, they are in the same uh, domain, and of course, if you look at the transport, maybe at some point they will collide. Okay, so this, this will be uh, the first uh, type of clustering between these, is that you can have a recollision like this. So this I will call an external recollision. Of course, uh, I, I should say that uh, you see that uh, there are many, uh, say, parameters, which are the uh, integration parameters. So both the number of collision, the time, uh, the, the velocity, the impact parameters. So all these are uh, uh, integration parameters. Okay, and of course, for uh, say you have different configurations depending on on this set of parameters. Okay, but for each set of parameters, you have one realization of this of this uh, true expansion. Okay, so one realization of the true expansion, say of the or so your trajectory, because here this is not just a uh, for each set of parameter. And so now what I would uh, like to do is to say that, okay, I, uh, so I can say that this FP is the sum of over all, this, all these parameters of, say, the initial data, uh, which is reached here at the bottom. Okay, so what I say is that I can write the FP as a sum over all these parameters of the initial data taken at this point. Okay, but now what I would like to do is to say, okay, I have this big, big integral, big, big sum over all parameters, but I will just split this sum in many uh, different uh, terms. And by just doing this, what I would like to, to uh, find is this cluster, uh, this cluster structure. Okay, so that's exactly what I try to do to say, okay, I start from this representation. I know that I can write this FP as a sum over plenty of uh, graphs like this. Okay, but now I will, let me just uh, try to uh, classify all these graphs, okay? So now I will try to explain how we, we classify all these graphs. So I will, uh, kind of use a little bit um, uh, abstract notation because uh, say all the details, the technical details of this are not really interesting. Okay. And I will try mostly to draw pictures because this is I think the, the most important thing. Then you just have to write words but it's not so important. Okay, so what I say is that my FP is the integral, so integral meaning uh, it can be uh, integrals or sums or whatever, okay? And then I have a, a measure, which is complicated, okay? So this measure is a measure over uh, the set of all parameters, so I, I maybe I should recall uh, what these parameters are. So you have the, the, the tree structure. So by tree structure, I mean that uh, I will for instance, impose that the first collision here is for uh, on this the particle number one. Okay, so I say that the first collision is here with the particle number one, and then that particle, uh, the second collision is here, and then the third is maybe here. I don't know. So okay, I, so I, I fix this tree structure. Okay, plus each time you have a collision, you have to uh, prescribe the time of this collision, which is a, uh, a parameter. 
uh, the angle of deflection and the new velocity. Okay, and uh, as many times as you have uh, as you have collision, you have to prescribe all these things. Okay, so this 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 is really a big uh, sum. Okay, and then what you have is um, plus. So you have also in this measure here, you have all this uh, cross section. Okay, so you have the okay. Maybe I can put it here. So the cross section here is just say the product for all i of this uh, term coming from the green formula, which is vi minus vai uh, dot omega i okay, plus something like this. Okay. And this is of course a time ti. Okay, so this is okay. Anyway, it's just a, a weight. So maybe I can just change the measure here. It's not really important. And then what I say is that, OK, I will just look at this uh, psi n. So psi n is really all this, uh, all this uh, graphical representation. And what I have to do is just to say that I will take f naught, so f naught of psi n. OK, so of course, this uh, f naught, I don't precise here say the, 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 the level of uh, the marginal because it depends on how many collision I have. Okay, so this. Okay, so now what I, uh, I would like to do is to split uh, this set of parameters here and to say that depending on, on which uh, set I am, I, I will have a different structure. Okay, so the first reason why I will separate things is that, so I will have some trees like this so maybe this, this is p minus 1, say, and this is p. And for instance, I can assume that I, I have also a recollision here. OK, so, so of course, if you have a recollision here, you see that in order to, con to, to construct the trajectory here for uh, times which are below this recollision time, you need to know th that you have this recollision. So you cannot construct say, uh, this part of the tree, this, this, uh, the, the part below here, without knowing the parameters for this tree here. Okay, so this means that these two trees, you cannot say, you cannot construct the trajectory independently uh, with, say, se construct this one and this one separately. Okay, so what I will call a forest is just a set of trees which are connected by external recollisions. Okay, so we define a forest. This is a set of trees which are connected by non recollision. Okay, of course, if you have one representation, you can decide whether or not you have a recollision. It's just one trajectory, and you see, you can just uh, observe whether or not you have this recollision. Okay? So this, this is, uh, and what I say is that, of course, if this, I have this tree, then you see that somehow I can construct this, uh, in each forest, I can construct the psi n, say, independently of each other. Okay, so what I say is that I can, uh, then I can um, somehow split the set of parameters. Parameters. Okay, so I assume that I have uh, uh, L forest, okay, and then I can say that uh, psi n will be just psi lambda 1, psi lambda n. Okay, if I have L forest, then I can construct all these small parts of the pseudo trajectory just independently from each other. Okay, I'd say that, okay. So this, this is one, one way of connecting two trees, okay? So this, this you, so you see, you, you should choose really um, uh, think about this, uh, this, uh, this recollision here as a clustering, exactly as in the abstract setting, as one possible clustering be between uh, two trees. Okay, so now the, the elementary object is one tree, it's not just one particle, it's really the dynamics of this particle or the history of this particle on this uh, time interval. Okay, so one object now is one guy like this. Okay, it's not just a particle, but really all the dynamics on this uh, time interval. 
Okay, so now I have this forest. So this is a forest and this is another forest. Okay, so, so this is the first way I see the uh, kind of connection. But now you see that being not in the same forest doesn't mean that you are independent. Okay, because of course you see that I have this forest, so I can can construct my pseudo trajectory. Uh, I'm fine. I can construct this pseudo trajectory here. I'm fine as well. But you you see that they are not independent because if really I move all this thing, see that at some point I could have uh, an overlapping between this one and this one, and then it's not it's not permitted. Okay, so it's not completely true that. Okay, so this means that you have, for instance, condition here on the root of of the of the of the forest in order that you have no overlapping between these this two trajectories. Okay, so it's exactly like like uh, in in the case of uh, the exclusion of particle. Here, this is the exclusion of forest. You say that okay, I'm not being in the same forest is not being independent. It's one minus uh, having an overlap. Okay, and this is exactly what I would like to develop. Okay, so now I, I will introduce a jungle, <laughs> and then I will stop. <laughs> so how I introduce this jungle is uh, a little bit more complicated because I have to do something before I. So here, just for the recollision, you see it's, it's simple. I have this dynamics, and then I look at the dynamics, and if there is a recollision, then I'm in the same forest. If not, I'm not in the same forest. This is quite simple. Now it's more complicated because what you would like to say is that, okay, so what I have is a kind of function phi of lambda 1, lambda L, which tells you that lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda L are not overlapping. Okay, so this this basically capital phi, say, it tells you that this is the um, it will be uh, so it tells you that you have non-overlapping forests. Okay, so what I say that I can rewrite the formula here as something like the product of the mu deep psi l lambda, okay, for all this lambda bit i equal 1 to l. But then I have this phi of lambda 1, lambda l, and then I have this, uh, all this uh, c of psi l, okay, so the c I can write here, here, okay, because they are separate, okay, they don't depend, it depends on, on what happens in the forest, okay, and then you have the f naught of this uh, psi l. Okay, so but what is important here is that this guy is completely factorized, okay? But because of this, now you don't have a, a perfect factorization. Okay, so now what I would like to do is to use the cluster expansion for this function here, okay? So now I will uh, use a cluster expansion for phi. So what I can... Uh, do is to write phi, so this is a phi L here. Phi L will be the sum from S equal 1 to L, the sum on all partition with S parts of the L here, of this uh, product of small phi i, okay, for uh, Okay, for sigma i. Okay, so I do exactly the same as for the uh, non-overlapping condition of particles. Uh, actually, I don't care that uh, there are particles or anything else. But I just say that I develop this non-overlapping condition with this uh, cumulant here. And now the this, this thing which is really important is that the small phi, okay, the, the, the cumulant, the small phi, you know that they are supported on clusters, okay? So each one of these phi sigma here is supported on a cluster of size 
uh, size of sigma i. Okay, so this means that when, when you have this sigma i, essentially, this tells you that all the forests which are in this, this sigma i, okay, you can, you, you have, say, in this expansion here, you will have an overlap. So an overlap will not modify the dynamics, okay? Now it's, it's completely a, a, an abstract expansion. The dynamics is fixed one forever, okay? And now what I say, I can play with this, this forest. I can just move them, okay? And sometimes they are not at the same uh, place, and sometimes they can overlap. But of course, I will not change the dynamics inside the forest, okay? So somehow they will not see each other, okay? But I can just move them. At some point, I know that uh, they will touch each other. Okay, so this is a, another way of, of clustering uh, to, um, and so now my jargon, what it is, it's just a set of trees, a set of forests which are connected by uh, an overlap. Okay, so now this is a set of forests connected by an overlap. So actually, I'm not completely done because I, I, there, there is still one a possible connection, which is with the initial data, but I will not. OK, there is actually a third, a third uh, step. So here, I have a first connection with the recollision, a, a second connection because of overlap. And then uh, normally, I should have another connection because this guy here, of course, I have also to, uh, to expand. Okay to see whether or not we have connection in this, in this part, okay? But because it's not perfect, say, if this guy was uh, uh, just a product at the, uh, at the beginning, then, then I would be done. But of course, because of the non-overlapping condition for the spheres, it's not an exact product, okay? So there is still some work to be done, but okay, we will just uh, forget about it for the moment. Okay, so now, uh, are you happy with this uh, decomposition? So now I can rewrite uh, this here. And I will have, uh, so I, I have to replace this phi by all this formula here, okay? But now I can uh, define the, this dynamical cumulant to be uh, just, so the dynamical cumulant of order P here will be uh, uh, the part, okay, which correspond to uh, having a connected graph here. So meaning that you should, in the end, have everybody in the same jungle. OK, so now the dynamical cumulant of order P so you can write a precise expression of this uh, using this, this, this expansion here and so on. But in the end, if you use the same definition for the di dynamical cumulant or for the generic cumulant, then uh, you like, uh, of course, uh, that uh, that uh, capital FP, you like it to be uh, the sum from S equal 1 to P of, of this guy here and the product here of the F uh, sigma i. Okay? And what I say is, is that if I, I, I require that I have this, then I can identify the, F, the small FP okay, in a unique way. And then the, this FP, what I see is that actually it's exactly localized on the jungle of size P. Okay, so corresponds to the set of parameters. So it's, it's still an integral over just a, a subpart of the, the whole set of parameters, such, such that. Um, we have a jungle of psi p. So the number of three which are in the jungle. So for each forest, I have a number of three in the, this forest, and then I add the, this number. Mm -hmm. And so what I would like to have, so what I say is that I have a, I have a jungle of, of size p if actually all these trees are connected either by a recollision or by a novel app. Okay, so this means that I uh, will have p minus one, at least p one, p minus one, clustering constraints. 
So what is important really here is that uh, I have this connected uh, structure. And then uh, with this, we can say uh, a lot actually on this, um, on this cumulant. So what we can prove actually is the following uh, theorem. So with a bit uh, more precise definition of everything. But, um, but uh, so what is important here is to see that uh, we have, uh, we can say many things about this, this FP, okay? So there are two important properties. So the first one is that uh, if you look at the L1 norm of FP, it, it does exactly what you want, so it's, it's small, okay? And how small it is, something like it's smaller than a constant, uh, so let me check, uh, time factor of P, time epsilon to D minus one, to P minus one. So maybe this is constant to the P. And this constant depends on the time, and of course everything uh, uh, just blows up at the time, uh, for the time of landfall. Okay, so we will not say uh, things for a longer time, but uh, at least we have this, so this tells you that really you, you with this cumulant here, you somehow uh, catch something about the, the, the structure of cumulant. So you know exactly uh, what will be the correction, what will be the correlation at any scale, okay? And then there is another, maybe even a more important property is that, so of course this depends on epsilon here, but you can uh, just look at the limit of this guy, okay? So you, we were able to, of course the first cumulant here is nothing else than the F1, so the guy who will be a solution of the Boltzmann equation in the limit, okay? But we can also say something about the other cumulants and their limit, okay? And so uh, in the limit, what is important is that FP corresponds to a minimally correct, a minimally connected graph. So you have exactly, so all the other things, so if you have more than one connection between two trees, then actually this, this, this configuration is not really important. Okay, so in the end, you have only exactly, so P minus one clustering constraints. So of course, in order to have uh, the limit uh, of this guy, you have to rescale by this factor here, else you don't see anything, but. Okay, and so maybe I can uh, just uh, draw a picture of this and, and, and I have five minutes to explain what you have to do to prove such a property. What, what did you say the time? You can, this L1 is a spatial L1. No, L1 is uh, L1, no. Uh, but where? Do you have spatial time? Uh, no, for the moment the time is fixed. Time is fixed, but what, what is the time scale? I, I look at any time which is smaller than the landfall time. So the time for which uh, okay, I'm not able to resum the, the series. Yeah. I can have, unfortunately we are not able to, because we have uh, all these uh, series and uh, we're not able to resum this for a longer time. It's, I, I know it's a pity, but that's. Yeah, sure. So actually, you don't really use uh, an infinity bound on solution because you see that the, the, the in all this story, what you do is that you work on operators acting on the initial data. So in the end, you, you only use bound on the initial data, but you, you see that you write all these operators with a series expansion, and so this series expansion, they are convergent only for this small t. So it's not really, it's not really as looking at a, a priori bound on the solution, but it's okay. It's Koshikolevsky. Yeah. Okay, so maybe uh, let me just uh, uh, say something about uh, about the proof of, of this. So um, the idea is the following: is that if you have your tree, so something that. So now I say that I have the same time. Okay, so let's just do it with three. Okay, so I know that a cumulant is represented by, a, a, by a, a jungle like this, meaning that here I have two, at least two, um, 
at least two points, two connecting, two clustering points. Okay. So now you see that the way you can estimate the, the norm of this of this guy is to say that in order that you have this clustering here, so either you have to have a recollision, <coughs> okay, or you have to uh, get an overlap. Okay. So start. Let's start with the case of recollision. Uh, overlap is essentially the same. So what you do is that you say, okay, let me fix this this tree here, okay, or at least uh, all the upper part of the tree, and then what I will do is just you know, uh, move the, the root of the tree here until I will collide this tree, okay? And so you see that if you do that, essentially what is important is the, is the size here of the corridor for which you will have a collision, okay? So this is a very uh, simple geometric picture. You have just like a cone, okay? And you say that in order that you can have this, this recollision between the two uh, trees, and you have to move a little bit this, this root here. But what is really important is that you really take the tree as a, a rigid structure and just move all the tree. You don't try to change a little bit all these uh, collision parameters. You fix the collision parameters. And then what you do is just change uh, the, 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 the localization of the root of the tree and just have this rigid motion of the tree. And then it's, it's easy to see that, uh, say, uh, having this uh, constraint here, it's something that you can uh, so for each one of these constraints, you will gain something like epsilon to the d minus one. Okay, just because uh, this is a uh, okay, you ri just write the equation that uh, x p x p minus x q, okay, minus uh, t times uh, v p minus v q has to be equal to epsilon omega. Okay, this is the, the equation for the for the collision. Okay, and th then you see that if you have fixed this uh, this uh, relative velocity here. Uh, of course, t is uh, is not fixed. It's one of it's one parameter, and so you you see that uh, you can parameterize this x p by the time here and this uh, vector here, which is on the on the sphere. Okay, and so with this parameterization, it's clear that you have a, a set which is of the order of epsilon to the d minus one. It's really a simple uh, uh, simple geometry. Okay, so now the only thing that you have to do in order to get uh, to get uh, this estimate here is to find the right order in which you should uh, move your tree, <laughs> okay? But of course, you see that if I move already this one, okay, in order to have this collision, then I cannot uh, move this one to have another collision with this one, okay? If I have moved, uh, see, if I have used, say, uh, the, 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 so say th this will be uh, uh, the, the tree P here, if I have mo moved P, to, to get the, this, 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 the realization of this, this, uh, this clustering here. I cannot move P once again, okay? I, I need to, have to identify independent variables, okay? So now, the, 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 the essentially, the proof here, so the proof relies on, say, a um, uh, process to, procedure to uh, identify uh, independent, so, so, yeah, independent uh, integration variables. So now I'm cheating a little bit, but essentially what you do is that you said inside the forest, you just identify the order of the first recollision, so the first time that this, this tree will uh, recollide, okay, so you, you just look at the order of recollision, Okay, say so mm -hmm. once these two, three have recollided, then uh, you say that now you look at this as a one structure, okay? And so it's really iterative. So you start with the first collision here. You say, okay, now I will move this one until I have a collision between these two, okay? Now I have this big structure that I can move like this, and I will move the, the whole structure to get a collision with this, etc. Okay, so this is really an iteration process, and you have to be a little bit careful to, to write this. For overlap, it's less important because, of course, overlap, they do not change the dynamics. Okay, while recollision, of course, they change. Okay, so this is exactly what you uh, do. And maybe the last thing that I have to say is, is, is about the proof of the second item here, is that once you have this structure, if you add any other connection, so for instance, a recollision between this and this, or another overlap, or anything like this, 
So, which means that you don't have a minimally connected graph, but just a connected graph. Then you can prove that this additional uh, thing will uh, help you to gain a little bit of smallness. Okay, so any additional constraint actually uh, tells you that uh, then the configuration will be negligible. Okay, so in the end, you end up with just the one with, with exactly p minus one uh, class ring. Okay, and now you, you, you see that even for the, from the geometric point of view, you know very well how this guy are because you, you know exactly how you sh should choose here uh, the, the localization of x1, x2, xp in order that you have this, this class ring. Okay, so it's, it's really, uh, actually it's really precise the, the, the way you can uh, construct this, uh, this guy. Okay, I think it's time to stop and tomorrow I will try to uh, use this characterization of, uh, it's not tomorrow, it's um, on Thursday, uh, to tell you how, how we can uh, use this, um, this, this precise characterization of, uh, of correlations in order to uh, obtain uh, this central limit theorem. So just characterizing the fluctuation around the Boltzmann dynamics. Okay, thank you very much.